This low fat experiment that I did on myself gave me insane results. Yeah, I dropped over 1% body fat in three weeks and gained two and a half pounds. So seemingly muscle. What I did is I modified a ketogenic diet two days per week. Now, full disclaimer on this. I'm gonna describe my results, I'm gonna describe what I did, and I'm gonna describe my theories and my hypothesis behind like why I had the results that I had. But I have to be very, very honest because in the scientific community, this wouldn't get a lot of credit because it's what's called an N equals one experiment. It's just me, okay? And there's a lot of variables. And I also only did it for three weeks. So yes, we'll expand more, and yes, I'll probably do a more in-depth whole study on this and try to investigate what's going on. But I do want to share my result in the interim because it's way too earth shattering and way too cool not to share. Plus, a lot of you have been waiting for this. So we'll go through this, we'll explain things, and then I'll give you my theories. And I think you'll probably want to give this a shot. First off, hey, if you haven't already, please do hit that red subscribe button and then hit that little bell icon so you can turn on notifications so you see our daily videos. I'm always doing these kind of self-experimentation things too. All right, let's have some fun. So let me give you the results first. All right, and I have them all in front of me. So I gained a little over two and a half pounds, actually gained 2.6 pounds. Uh, my body fat dropped over 1%. Now, this was done via caliper reading, okay? Because this started out unofficial. I should have done it as a DEXA scan, totally understand. But the fact is it was still a consistent drop, which tells me that something was changing and it more than likely was actual body fat. When we start getting nerdy on some of this stuff, my glucose levels stayed the same. And what I did when I went low fat keto two days per week is I doubled my protein intake and reduced my fat. So I remained, the, the calories remained the same. So anyhow, point is I doubled my protein intake and it didn't change my blood glucose. Okay. My ketones increased, which goes against the grain of what a lot of people would say. You double your protein intake, it would kick you out of keto, right? No, my ketones increased. In fact, after a workout, my ketone levels were higher. I actually had ketones post-workout. Normally, after you work out, your ketone levels crush. They, they go away. This changed that. Anyhow, now uh, my visual representation, which there's a picture popping up on the screen right now that shows week one, week two, and week three. I think you can see for yourself, there's a pretty significant difference. So even if you wanted to argue it was water weight, whatever, something changed, and it was just two days a week. My aerobic capacity, although very subjective, seemed to dramatically improve, felt significantly better. Maybe it was just because I had more protein in my body and I was more recovered, who knows? Here's what was really wild, my strength. Now, once again, this was measurable uh, in a somewhat of a subjective way, but it was 225 pound bench press. Week one, my average bench press was 14 reps at 225. By week three, I was cranking it all the way up to 19 reps. Placebo effect, perhaps, okay? Extra protein giving me more intracellular volume, perhaps. Point is, that's not important. Something changed. Now, I wanna go into what I actually did because you need to know the overall breakdown of this. Now, a lot of you can poke holes and I just don't want this to be a 30 minute video. So I'm going to abbreviate a little bit and we can always do more in depth videos. So I went low fat, high protein, two days per week. So I didn't do the whole thing. I just did two days per week. And my theory was that if I reduce fat intake but increase protein, Will my body have no choice but to start pulling from my stored body fat tissues? Well, I think that was the case. But anyhow, here's what it looked like. I reduced my fat by 50%. I normally ate 150 grams of fat, which would be 1,350 calories. I reduced that to 75 grams of fat, which is 675 calories. Then with my protein, I normally consume 150 grams of protein. In this case, I doubled it, or actually more than doubled it, to 320 grams, which was 1,280 calories. Point is, on my low fat, high protein days, I was eating within five to 10 calories of what I would eat on a higher fat, lower protein day. My calories remained the same. The macronutrients just changed. And a big part of this experiment was to see, would too much protein cause a problem for me if I did it periodically? Seemingly not, right? Now, anyhow, the other piece of the equation, I consumed a lot more vegetables. So this wasn't a carnivore experiment. I consumed a lot more vegetables because I knew I was increasing protein and decreasing fat, and I would probably get a little bit hungry. So I doubled my Brussels sprouts intake. I usually eat about a cup and a half or so of Brussels sprouts a day. I actually ate closer to three. And that was just for satiety. I also doubled my broccolini or baby broccoli intake. And then I had a good amount of asparagus with dinner. Okay, so I did increase my vegetable content. Now, when you start looking at some of the overall effects of veggies, when you look at the actual microbiome change, it usually takes about three weeks to see a result. 
So this could very well be the issue too. It could be the, 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 what happened, right? More veggies, I changed my butyrate levels. When you consume veggies, they get broken down into butyrate, which is a very, very good short chain fatty acid that feeds the intestine, therefore making you healthier and possibly leaner. So that could have been the situation. I also had a 50 gram whey protein shake post-workout. Okay, about 30 to 60 minutes post-workout. When I'm not doing this kind of thing, I'll usually do whey or pea protein. But then I had a 30 gram pea protein shake in the PM. I'm just saying this because it wasn't all meat. The reason that I added shakes in there is because it was very hard for me to eat 320 grams of protein from just meat. Uh, anyhow, I also still did my intermittent fasting regimen two times per week. Okay, I usually fast two to three times per week, sometimes more. And in this particular case, I did my normal 16 to 18 hour fast the day after my low fat keto day. So I had my low fat day, and then the next day I did my fast, okay? Now, the reason that I mention this is because as we go further into this video, I'm gonna talk about something known as PPAR alpha. That is a receptor protein that gets activated when you're in a fasting state that upregulates all kinds of really cool things. Point is, is I think that fasting the day after this low fat keto day ended up really causing a positive impact, okay? We'll talk more about it. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna get into the nitty gritty a little bit. And later on in this video, uh, I have a clip from a friend of mine, Nick Norwitz, who's a uh, PhD student out at Oxford University. And he helps me out a lot with his channel and I wanted his opinion on some stuff. And I also consulted with a good friend of mine, Dr. Ryan Lowry, who is really well known. He's a PhD in the ketone world. Uh, got some of his input on PPAR alpha. So some big credit to him too. So I've linked out to them down below just so you can check them out because they're a part of this. Uh, anyway, let's discuss protein. That's what I want to go through here. The extra protein did not kick me out of keto. Okay? In fact, ketones were higher post-workout than they normally are. Okay, and then my ketone levels did drop some days on my non-low non fat days by about 0.2 millimoles. Absolutely negligible. Glucose levels remained stable. My fasting glucose was five points higher, but that would simply just be described probably from gluconeogenesis from the you know, break down uh, proteins into sugars in the body. But five point increase, that's nothing, okay? Uh, my first workout ketones remained. I wanna talk on this for a second. The simple explanation that I wrote down for this is that excess protein uh, potentially caused an increase in glycogen stores, which shifted my metabolism towards the carbs. Thus, the stored beta hydroxybutyrate in my bloodstream wasn't consumed during workout. What that means, because I consume so much protein, it converted into glucose and the glucose actually refilled my muscles because protein turns to glucose, but it's demand driven. It'll only turn it into glucose if it needs it. Well, my muscles clearly needed it. So it filled my muscles with that glucose, glycogen, which means that when I worked out, I was burning that glycogen and not having to burn through my ketones in my blood, therefore keeping myself in ketosis. More protein might be the answer. Anyhow. So wouldn't a lot of protein kick you out of keto? Well, this is a great time to tackle gluconeogenesis. Now, the process of gluconeogenesis, like I said before, it's driven by demand and not by supply. So that means if you consume a bunch of protein, what you don't need, your body will just excrete or potentially just stores fat directly. So the point is, is it's not gonna just magically turn to sugar and kick you out of keto. That's a myth, okay? That's old science, which I have to fall on the sword because I used to talk about that all the time, okay? Now, a lot of the protein that I had, again, did come from meat. So it was absorbed a little bit slower. Big shout out, by the way, to ButcherBox because they sponsored this whole experiment for myself. I'd say about 40% of the overall protein that I consumed was from ButcherBox. So big shout out to them. I did go ahead and put a link down below. If you're wanting to try this experiment or anything like that, ButcherBox is an online meat delivery service. So it's cheaper than the grocery store to get grass fed, grass finished meat. If you're gonna try this kind of experiment for yourself, you wanna do it with really high quality protein. So there's a special discount to save a couple bucks and also just to be able to get my fan discount with ButcherBox. So check them out down below in the description after you watch this video and that way you can try this experiment out for yourself. So big thank you to ButcherBox for supporting this channel. Thank you to ButcherBox for supporting this challenge or this experiment with myself and thank you for extending the pricing out to everybody else. So they're down below. Anyhow, back to uh, the gluconeogenesis piece. Gluconeo I, I highlighted some things here because there's so much here. This is, I, I wanna make sure I get it all right. Okay, so gluconeogenesis is a slow process and the rate doesn't change even under a wide variety of conditions. What that means is the body controls the, the migration of protein into glucose, okay? It doesn't change much even if you're totally exhausted or not exhausted, it's all pretty balanced. Having insufficient material available for gluconeogenesis will obviously limit the rate, but in experiments, having excess material did not increase the rate. This is pulled from studies. What this means is, if you're low on protein 
it does decrease the rate of gluconeogenesis, but if you have too much, it doesn't seem to increase it. So it only slides and moves if you're too low. If you have too much protein, it doesn't increase gluconeogenesis at any faster rate, which explains why I actually probably burned fat. The extra protein probably just triggered more of a metabolic increase. Um, the thing I wanna make sure, I, I would note here, the fats that you're consuming on keto also get converted into sugar. So don't be tripping, right? That's what I wrote that. Anyhow, the fatty acids that we have in our body, what happens is the fatty acid gets liberated into the bloodstream, but a fatty acid is a triglyceride. Fatty acids bound to a glycerol molecule. When we burn the fatty acid, we're left with a glycerol molecule. Well, that glycerol gets turned into sugar as well through gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is not just protein getting converted into sugar. It is also excess portions of fats getting converted into sugar. Why we don't talk about that in the keto community, I don't know. The point is having a bunch of keto coffee and a bunch of high fat beverages like that still gives you a risk of creating glucose just as much as having a big steak or a bunch of chicken would. So anyway, I rest my case there. Now, the other thing we have to look at is gluconeogenesis is a hormone signaler, okay? Now, so what ends up happening is we have a baseline of insulin. What I wrote here is, much of gluconeogenesis isn't even protein related. We have things like lactate, we have glutamate, we have alanine and glycerol, all the main gluconeogenic precursors in humans, together accounting for more than 90% of overall gluconeogenesis. That's directly from Diabetes Care Journal. Okay, so protein only accounts for 10% of the overall gluconeogenesis process. I don't wanna go into a whole lot of detail here, but the point is there's a lot of different processes with gluconeogenesis. And point is, I had a lot of protein. It didn't kick me out of keto, and this is the reason why. And I reduced my fat, which allowed my body to utilize those fat stores. So now, let's move into, well, I will actually make a note that typically in studies you'll see that uh, being in keto itself is going to increase gluconeogenesis naturally by about 14 or 15%. Okay, I wanna get into this fun stuff here. So now, I wanna talk about PPAR alpha, which is an interesting receptor protein, which is really what triggered me to do this whole thing anyway. Now, PPAR alpha gets released when our body fat gets liberated. So what that means is, an example, when we're fasting, our body has no choice but to allow fatty acids to get liberated into the bloodstream. Well, when that happens, that signals specific proteins in the body to do specific things. And one of those specific proteins is PPAR alpha. It is a signal, it receives a signal saying, this guy is burning fat, right? Well, PPAR alpha therefore goes around and does a lot of other things, okay? It, triggers uncoupling protein, so it increases your core body temperature at some degree. It's also a stimulator of ketones at the liver level. So that could have meant that, wait a minute, because I did this low fat keto day, PPAR alpha upregulated, and then the following day I fasted, I had way more PPAR alpha. So that means I got way more fat burning potential. This is my theory. Is it proven? Not necessarily, but the science is there backing up PPAR alpha. Okay, so let me just read to you a little bit about what I've kind of learned about PPR alpha and some of the things I've talked with Dr. Ryan Lowry about and all this stuff. Okay, so it's the key molecule of fasting is what it's been called. It's activated by fatty acids liberated from adipocytes in the fasted state. It then acts as the transcription factor for genes important in the uptake of fatty acids into the cell and its subsequent op uh, oxidation. So what that means is it works at a genetic level to help you burn more fat. So PPAR alpha makes us shift from burning carbohydrates to burning more fat. Okay, carbs need to be spared for glucose dependent tissues like erythrocytes and partially brain. Okay, so what that means is, in this case, PPR alpha takes us from being carb burning machines over to being fat burning machines. And the more PPR alpha you have, the more essentially fat adapted you become. Okay, PPR alpha is also a stimulator of ketogenesis, which explains why my ketones were higher. It explains why a lot of times your ketones will get higher when you fast than they will when you are doing keto, right? Because well, you're flat out allowing more fats from your tissue to be liberated. When you're doing keto with a lot of fat, you're bringing the fat in and you're not having to liberate it from your own tissues. It's got something to burn. The goal is to let your body burn what you have stored on you. So anyhow, now I get into uh, the veggie consumption because here's the thing. I have noticed that when I consume more veggies, my ketone levels are higher. And I was consistently wondering why. But before I get into that, check out this quick little clip that uh, Nick Norwitz gave me because he's someone that I really trust. And again, he helps me out a lot with research whenever I'm like stumped and stuff like that. So check this out. When I got the details of your experiment, I got really excited. And my mind went in like a million directions. 
and I think it's totally cool and fair game to speculate about things like PPAR alpha and glucosinolate intake and all that stuff. And we can do that in the future. But I also want to resist the temptation from getting too scientifically tunnel visioned right now. Um, because there's a tendency to kind of focus in on a model or a hypothesis and then miss the big picture. And so maybe each of these things is contributing to the big picture, but we want to think about big picture. So what do we know? Well, what we know is it takes time for the body to adapt to big dietary shifts. And during this period of dynamic change, there are often big changes in things like physique. So I think it's because you're right now in this period of change where your microbiome shifting, there's changes in expression of your like, you know, fat burning enzymes and carb burning enzymes. Maybe your mitochondria are still specialized for burning fat. And so they're just guzzling fat off your body because you're not getting enough in your diet relative to what they expect. Um, so my hypothesis is that if you were to stick this through for a little bit longer than three weeks, maybe six weeks, eight weeks, things will plateau out. Which sounds discouraging, but I actually think is really important and exciting because it's representative of metabolic flexibility, which is what you actually want. That's good health, not high ketones. Good health is metabolic flexibility. And I also want you to think about this. You know, if you're experiencing improvements with change, which is pretty common, I've done as well in my own experiments, then you know, maybe you're helping to break ground on getting to that next stage in mindset about health, where we're not each trying to find an optimal um, diet, even optimal for us as individuals. What we're doing is we'll maybe appreciate and realize that it's not a particular diet that fits us best, but it's in the pushing our body to metabolically change and adapt continually that we find the best results. So maybe you're gonna be the guy that helps to break ground on figuring out what is that ideal period for you know dietary cycling. Is it two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months? I think you need to continue this and we need to find out. But bottom line, I think this is super exciting. And as you collect more data, I am super happy to talk more about this. Peace, man. Okay, so now the question that I'm gonna bring up. Could the additional veggies have made a big impact? So what we have to look at from a quick molecular level is beta-hydroxybutyrate is the main ketone body, and it's made in the liver, okay? But it's molecularly very, 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 very similar to what's called butyrate, which is what is created when we digest vegetables. It's a short-chain fatty acid. Butyrate can be turned into ketones, okay? But can it be hydroxylized right in the gut? Not really, we don't know that, I don't think it can. Point is, is why did my ketones get so much higher? Could it have been the veggies? Well, we dove into this a little bit. I think some of it could have been inflammation related, to be completely honest. I was consuming veggies, so I had more butyrate feeding the intestinal cells because they eat butyrate, therefore healing a leaky gut a little bit more, but I don't think that I had a leaky gut to start. So this isn't a fair example. If I was very unhealthy and had metabolic syndrome and was highly inflamed, this could be a you know, valid hypothesis, but I just don't think that it really was. Anyhow. So beta-hydroxybutyrate is a ketone body, but butyrate is a short-chain fatty acid. They're not the same thing. I know this is scientific, but this is interesting stuff. So one paper all the way back in 1962 showed that the liver can turn butyrate from vegetables into beta-hydroxybutyrate, ketones, okay? This was published in the Biochemical Journal. However, for the most part, and for practical purposes, it's best to think that butyrate and BHB are separate, and that's fair, okay? BHB is made in the liver from the breakdown of fat, whereas butyrate is made by bacteria in your gut from the breakdown of fiber in the stomach. Okay? Now, the Journal of Functional Foods in 2017 published a study uh, that said 10 healthy volunteers in which they gave them breakfast of toast and jelly with skim milk along with either nothing else, MCT oil, or straight butyrate. Here's what's wild and proves a little bit of my theory. Interestingly, they found that butyrate was much more ketogenic than MCT. I mean, butyrate comes from veggies, okay? If you look at the data in the bar graph, you'll see that a four gram dose of butyrate is twice as ketogenic as MCT, even though the MCT dose is 10 grams. Now, if you took these people and they were not consuming toast and jelly, you could probably imagine the veggies would have elicited a lot more of a ketogenic response. The takeaway is that butyrate is ketogenic and veggies will get broken down into a short chain fatty acid that will help produce ketones. This could have explained why even despite having high levels of protein, my ketones went very high. It's also a signaling molecule, which we can talk, it's a histone deacetylase inhibitor, so if you're scientific, you can know what that means. Anyhow, point is, it was all an experiment. Okay, so 
we don't have a solid answer. But let me post up some problems here, okay? Because here's what we have to look at, and here's why I did this uh, little experiment on myself. People think that you need more fat, plain and simple. Okay, you see it way too often. Fat bombs here, fat bombs there, high fat cookie here, high fat whatever here, all to help you produce more ketones. Who cares if you're producing more ketones if you're not pulling it from your body fat stores? Okay, my results speak for themselves. What about yours? Okay, you have to make sure that you're applying what you can and try to get the most out of this. Now, we only rely on a period of fasting or exercise to tap into stored tissue. That's the other issue, right? We rely on our exercise to burn fat or we rely on fasting to burn fat. Well, what if we can activate similar pathways by just temporarily reducing fat? I'm trying to change the game of how we look at keto here. We're also concerned that protein will ruin everything. I think we debunked that. People get concerned with too many veggies on keto because of the fibers. Well, I think the butyrate result of breaking down those fibers is great. And I know there's a lot of carnivore people probably watching this video. I'm not anti-carnivore, but the point is, is I'm seeing that veggies actually may have improved, but it's not conclusive. One would think that it's a caloric deficit, but my calories stayed the same. Did I potentially burn more fat because protein takes more calories to digest? Could that have been it? The actual digestive load of protein is higher. Maybe I was just incinerating more calories because my body was breaking down protein, right? So obvious observations, okay? Simply put, maybe I just needed more protein. That's an obvious one too, okay? Maybe I, maybe I just, I work out a lot. Maybe my body needed the protein and I wasn't getting enough before. And now all of a sudden it started to recover. So I felt better my muscles filled up and I got leaner because my metabolism was working. The thing is too much autophagy is just as bad as not enough. So having more protein every now and then isn't going to negate the process of autophagy on the days you fast. You want to have these clean switches, high protein, fast, high protein and fast. Okay. Could I have handled more protein because I have bigger muscles to fill with glycogen? This is a big one. And this is probably very true. Protein does get broken down into glucose. Glucose goes into your muscles and fills them up with muscle glycogen. If you have bigger muscles, like I do, you're going to need more glucose to fill them up. So maybe my demand of my body, was higher. Maybe I needed more protein to actually convert into glucose to actually store as glycogen. Maybe that's my way of restoring my glycogen levels. Maybe that's your way. Maybe if you work out a lot or you have a good amount of muscle or you're just a heavy person because a heavy person that's carrying around a lot of fat is still going to have big muscles generally. Okay. They're going to have muscles in their legs from carrying that. You might need more protein to actually fill those up and maybe you'll just feel better. So when you look at the overall results, my results were pretty awesome and I'm going to do more on this and do a longer study. See you tomorrow.